Hello, I'm Judith A. Yates, true crime author and criminologist. This is Best True Crime. Every episode, I take you on a journey to explore crime, forensics, and investigations. I want to take you back to a time when the word serial killer had not yet passed our lips, when murderers were not glamorized in pop culture. It's London, East End, the 1800s. We know him best as the elusive serial killer, Jack the Ripper. We're here in the Whitechapel District, the slums where the Ripper targeted helpless women, slicing up the dead bodies before disappearing into the night. He will never be caught. But this is not London. This is what's called a book nook. It is about eight by eight inches, and it was created by Laura Murray, who lives in Surrey, UK. When most people think of book nooks, they envision a special quiet place where they can go read uninterrupted by themselves. Now book nooks are tiny worlds tucked into a bookcase amongst books. The idea is to take you by surprise as you peruse the shelf. Many book nooks make use of mirrors to create optical illusions and depth. Most have a theme, a popular movie, a replica of an actual location, or a reenactment of a historical moment. Murray says, I have always had a bit of a penchant for Victorian horror and funerals. Jack the Ripper has always held a mystique and interest for me. The grimy underworld of Victorian prostitution mixed with the urges of a serial killer of, most certainly, the educated classes. Laura admits that, like so many others, the fact that the Ripper's identity is still unknown makes it beguiling. Would we still be intrigued if we knew who Jack the Ripper was, or was not? So, when she learned about book nooks, with her interest in Victorian period and the case of Jack the Ripper, Laura Murray began to gather the tools to create her own book nook. In between a full-time job and a daily commute of two hours, Laura worked for three weeks on her project. In the end, she estimates it took about 14 hours to complete. First, she started a Pinterest board of Victorian alleys of London. She studied pictures of starving, shoeless little street children, crumbling house facades, and the hanging dirty laundry. A perfectionist, Laura focused on details. She particularly wanted to capture the poor lighting and stark shadows, the cobblestone streets and the types of shops, dusty glass and building materials. I wanted everything to be just right, Laura says. And construction began. Laura began to build a Whitechapel alleyway at night. She utilized a mirror to give the impression of two streets. With a nod to Sweeney Todd, it has a barber's and a butcher shop, all constructed carefully by hand, just as the builders in the 1800s would have done. And of course, there is the Tin Bells Pub, where it is said at least two of the victims frequented and possibly met their killer, the Ripper. The Tin Bells Pub still stands today and is a must-see for true crime aficionados. When this little dolly was having tea parties, she had no idea of her future role in Laura's artwork as a ripper victim. Just as Annie Chapman, who frequented the Tin Bells Tavern, had no idea that when she left Tin Bells on September 7, 1888, she would be found dead the next morning. While the placement of this victim is not historically correct, Laura Murray says she purposely placed her there. Laura says, I wanted to make the victim seem pitiable and sadly aloft in such a dark and disused space, discarded like rubbish. The callousness of the Ripper was something I wanted to convey. Laura's purpose was not to glorify the killer. She wants to convey the sadness and gloom of Whitechapel during these times, the environment where Jack the Ripper crept. It was long believed that the Ripper's victims were all prostitutes. In the 19th century, the word prostitute did not always mean a woman who exchanged sex for money. The term was used to describe women who lived with men without legally married or had children outside of wedlock. And in Victorian times, sex with your husband was considered a duty, not a pleasure. So a woman who enjoyed sex was also considered a prostitute. There have been five victims labeled the canonical five. 
because it is believed their killer was the same person, presumably Jack the Ripper. The Ripper's victims lived in squalor, homelessness. They were, as far as anyone cared to know, unmarried. Perhaps they sold sex for food, alcohol, a place to sleep. Thus, these ladies were immediately labeled prostitutes. Meet the Canonical Five. It was 1888 when it happened. Marianne Nichols, known as Polly, was the daughter of either a locksmith or a blacksmith. Polly married William Nichols, and they had five children. They divorced soon after, and the reasons are not clear. Either William was a cheat, Polly was a prostitute, or Polly was a drunk. Nonetheless, William was forced by law to pay her money until his claim that she was a prostitute. Then the money stopped. She left her family to go live in a workhouse where she could live while offered employment. This usually meant difficult and laborious work. Polly worked as a servant girl until her drinking got her fired. Like so many other single women, she lived on the street, surviving on handouts and liquor. Polly was no stranger to the main streets. She grew up near Gunpowder Alley and Fleet Street. There is no evidence she was a sex worker just a police assumption based on the fact she was female, on the streets, and unmarried. The body of Mary Ann Nichols was discovered at about 3.40 a.m. on Friday, August 31st in Bucks Row, Whitechapel. Nichols had last been seen approximately one hour before the discovery of her body. She was going to work, she had told someone, just enough to raise money for a bed to sleep in. She proudly wore a new bonnet. A jolly bonnet, she had bragged earlier. I'm sure to get work. Annie Chapman had been born Eliza Ann Smith, and she was the daughter of a soldier. She tried a sip of alcohol at a young age and enjoyed it so much that the sips turned into binges. Her father would eventually commit suicide. Her siblings would beg her to stay sober to no avail. She grew to be only five foot tall with blue eyes and dark hair. She was social and intelligent, a wonderful conversationist, until rum entered the room. She would eventually marry a distant relative, John Chapman, as the norm in these times. One of their three children was born crippled and placed in a home. Another daughter, seen here, died of meningitis at age 12. Both Eliza and John began drinking heavily. She and her husband were alcoholics. Their reason for separation was drunkenness on Eliza's part. John died of alcohol-related illness, so her penance disappeared, and Annie was forced on the streets of Whitechapel. Again, a single woman on the mean streets, an alcoholic. She was not a concern in Victorian London. During this time, Eliza became Annie. She had no idea of her surviving children. Depression snagged her into a black hole of drunkenness and sadness. It was 6 a.m. on Saturday, September 8th, in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street, Spitting Fields, and the body of Annie Chapman was discovered near the steps to the doorway. The unknown killer they called Jack the Ripper had struck again. Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes were both murdered in the early morning hours of Sunday, September 30th. Elizabeth Stride's body was discovered at 1 a.m. in Dutfield's yard off Burner Street in Whitechapel. It was a sad ending to a sad life. Born into a Swedish farming family, she learned hard work very early. She was one of four children and they all worked the family farm. Elizabeth was tiny, standing just barely over five foot tall, with dark brown hair and light gray eyes. She spoke Yiddish and English. She had given birth to a stillborn baby. Elizabeth was a quiet woman, known to be of a serious nature. She slaved as a domestic servant, eventually moving to England where her mother died. Her, she married a man over 20 years her senior, John Stride, a ship's carpenter. They started a business, which ultimately failed. John and Elizabeth would eventually part ways. He would die of tuberculosis. She spent months in a hospital for bronchitis. She also contracted a venereal disease early in life. She had a relationship with another man, bouncing between him and the workhouse. She had created a new life, telling others she was the survivor of a shipwreck where her husband and nine children perished. For this, she received handouts. 
Elizabeth lived on the streets, hustling for what little she could get. She also took in sewing and some work as a domestic. She was arrested for soliciting and for drunk and disorderly. It's suspected she suffered mental health issues due to a lifelong case of syphilis. Catherine Kate Eddowes was an educated woman, literate, with a primary school level education. She was one of ten children. When her parents died, she was sent to first an orphanage, then to live with her aunt's family in Wolverhampton. She was 14. Her aunt had found her her job, but Catherine was caught stealing. Catherine bounced from job to job, place to place. She fell for an Irish balladeer and former soldier, Thomas Conway. They traveled about Britain, had three children together, but the partnership became abusive. Catherine was an alcoholic. She was five feet tall with dark auburn hair and hazel eyes. After her murder, friends would recall a very jolly woman always singing and an intelligent and scholarly person but possessed of a fierce temper. They settled in London and here Catherine left her family, a bottle of booze tucked under one arm. Thomas went into hiding, keeping her children away from her. Catherine began seeing another man who was also an alcoholic. They led a flotsam life on and off the streets. On September 29, 1988, Catherine was found lying drunk in the street. She was drugged into the local police station, given the name Nothing, until she sobered up. Then she tottered out about 1 a.m. the next morning. Catherine Eddowes' body was found in Meter Square about 45 minutes after she left the police station and after the discovery of Elizabeth Stride's body. The woman known as Nothing was dead and even on her headstone, she remains forever tied to her killer. Mary Jane Kelly was a mystery. She appeared in central London sometime around mid-1883 at private balls. Perhaps she was shopping for a wealthy gentleman. Perhaps the host was hosting this party for wealthy gentlemen and providing prostitutes. Mary Jane also worked in the tawdry West End brothels. She told multiple stories of her past, she was from well-to-do people. She was a scholar, a painter. She was from Ireland, which may have been true. She claimed to have siblings, and at different times they held different positions in life. She was pretty by the day's standards, light hair, blue eyes, buxom, and slender. Tall at 5'7", she rarely wore the fashionable hat, but always wore a clean white apron. Mary Jane was a known prostitute soliciting between brothels and boarding houses in Wapping, Whitechapel, and Bethnal Green. At one high-class brothel, if there is such a thing, she was the most popular girl and wore fine clothing. She had her own hired carriage. Mary Jane fled her life at the brothel after a serious run-in with dangerous people. She ended up at East End, bouncing between relationships, perhaps a marriage. A drunken Mary Jane would belt out Irish songs. A drunken Mary Jane could be mean and abusive. Dark Mary, they would call her. At 10.40 a.m. on Friday, November 9th, Mary Jane Kelly's mutilated body was discovered lying in her bed in the single room where she lived at 13 Miller's Court off Dorset Street. She was just 25 years old when she died. Even in death, the misconceptions and sadness of Mary Jane Kelly's life followed her. Her obituary read in part, The remains of Mary Janet Kelly, who was murdered on 9th November in Miller's Court, Dorset Street, was brought yesterday morning from Shoreditch Mortuary to the cemetery at Leightonstone, where they were interred. No family member could be found to attend the funeral. Her name was spelled incorrectly, and yes, her family was missing. These were the women who, for a brief time in history, were the victims of an unknown assailant believed to be Jack the Ripper. But they were more than victims. Their lives were tough, fueled by the times, the roles forced upon women, and substance abuse. But they were people who lived and breathed, like all victims, these women were more than murdered subjects. They had lives, families, friends. Some were married and had children. They had dreams. 
They had names and birthdays, but they will always be known as the victims of Jack the Ripper. Laura Murray's work can be viewed on her Instagram account, smaller.than.life. It features pictures of her 12th scale work. Be sure to take a look at her amazing work. Hey everyone, let's stop for a moment and let me give you a few tips to help you stay safe. Now, no one is ever 100% safe. I can't do that for you, but I can give you a few tips on protecting your valuables. Now, just the other day I was at the store and I saw this great idea. It was a fake rock with a false bottom where you can put your keys in case you ever get locked out of your house or you need to leave them for somebody else. This fake rock looked like a fake rock. And guess what? Criminals shop the same exact places where you shop. So they're gonna know what the fake rock looks like. Now, most homes are gonna be burglarized by someone that knows the home. The person that mows your yard, the person that delivers packages and mail, the person that lives next door to you, or the kid down the street just looking for fast cash. But, let's back up for a bit. What about leaving this fake rock out for somebody? What about leaving the keys under the mat? Criminals know these ideas, all right? And that fake rock is pretty expensive too. Let me give you a better idea. First of all, a medicine bottle. Everybody has one around the house. If you say, well, I don't take medicine, borrow one, okay? Ask somebody for one. And an actual rock, preferably one with a flat bottom, okay? And some good old fashioned super glue or gorilla glue, all right? Drop said keys into the bottle and put the top on. Now, let me show you what you go and do with this. So Solomon's going to help me here. What we're going to do is we're going to dig a hole in the ground and we're going to put this medicine bottle just so the top is up on the surface of the ground. Then you're going to take some rocks and leaves and dirt and put it around to where only this rock is showing. This. Now, here's one of the keys. It's put it next to a place such as a tree, uh, such as the fence post, so that one, you remember where it is, and two, you can tell the person who needs to get a hold of the keys where it's located. Now, here's another tip. Put it so that the neighbors don't want to wonder why this person is digging in the middle of the yard or by the mailbox or what have you. One, be sure and hide it where it's in a place where it's actually hidden from the neighbor's sight. For example, there's a fence behind it. Then you've got this forked tree here so that you don't have a lot of eyes watching that person as they come over and dig up your bottle. You can get more tips like this in my book, How to Recognize the Devil, at www.truecrimebook.net. All proceeds benefit a nonprofit organization. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Best True Crime. I'm Judith A. Yates, and I hope you subscribe. Be sure to visit truecrimebook.net and be safe out there.